she had said as maybe a, an icebreaker that we could have something that wouldn't just be, hi, my name is, I like to do whatever. Yeah. Um, it could be, hi, my name is, this was my favorite space I've ever been in my life. On It could be on a trip, it could be, you know, like a home or whatever else. And, and it's really interesting to have people think about that sort of thing. So in Queensland, I mean, even though I had participants from all across Australia, I had a couple of participants who talked about growing up in a Queenslander home, which is a very specific typology of home. You know, that would be normally kind of up on stilts, allow for passive ventilation, have outside, you know, you could sit on a porch. Yeah. And Google um, it for non Australians, just Google it. Yes, yeah. please. They're very interesting. Um, but that was kind of a lovely memory to evoke for people. And so they not only were able to start understanding the specific architectural elements of a space that they responded well to, yeah. but feelings that came with it. And, you know, a little bit about the response to it now. Like, what is a nostalgic kind of response? And what is something that's valuable that they could take from that now to apply in the future? <laughs> All right, this is Dr. Matthew Asiello. Welcome to Researching Happy. This is the weekly podcast all about the stories behind the studies of the happiness and well-being research world. Now, I say weekly, um, having just skipped a week, so I apologize for that. It's been a crazy, um, busy few weeks, and so I didn't get around to the posting the episode last week like I was planning to, so I apologize for that. Um, but there'll be some nice updates coming soon about some of the research and the, the analysis that we've been doing. So um, some exciting stuff there. Um, Welcome to episode 23. This is an exciting example, I think, of us on this show. One of the aims is trying to learn about different efforts to improve well-being that are coming from other fields, um, you know, fields other than psychology. Um, and so this time coming from architecture and the built environment. And a nice example or not a nice example, I guess, to be honest with you, was uh, came today while I was driving um, my son. We do He does uh, kids jujitsu, which sounds like, making kids fight each other but it's kind of like a a parent and child kind of pairing thing so it's kind of fun um we're driving and we noticed all, along the way a new building which is popping up and it turns out it's a new mcdonald's like so already first reaction like are we seriously still doing this like how anyway so whatever there's a new maccas popping up but there's a new building um there's another new building popping up right next door and we kind of like noticed, slowed down a bit because he likes to see the construction site. And it turns out it's a childcare center. So, you know, how on earth is this happening basically? Like, anyway, I don't know who makes these decisions, whatever. Anyway, it was a decent example, I guess, of where we're going in this episode that considerations around the built environment and, and um, architectural and engineering decisions can make a big influence on our well-being. So today we welcome Dr. Jenna Micus, who uses her education and years of experience in engineering, architecture and design to curate environments and experiences for flourishing. And her PhD, which we talk a lot about, was focused specifically on understanding how to design for eudaimonic well-being in the built environment. We didn't obviously go here, but lesson one is don't put your kids in a childcare that's five meters away from a McDonald's. I guess that's my opinion. Um, some of you might disagree, that's okay. Um, but in her PhD, Jenna really sought to gain this, this understanding by co-designing with older adults within the context of their home environment. And the results of her research become, as we discuss, this eudaimonic design um, framework with design guidelines that characterize this idea of a eudaimonia supportive environments. Um, in this case, obviously for older adults, but I think it basically applies um, it can be generalized across other demographics as well. And I think this is a really nice episode, not only because I think Jenna was, was great to chat with, but um, it's very instructive, I guess. So I think I had in my mind when it was talking about architecture, this idea of, you know, the, like specifically the way buildings are built, um, like decisions around where you put windows and doors and stuff. But I think Jenna really brought this um, lovely detail to the idea that, you know, it can be anywhere from that range of, you know, like the physical the physical environment, all the way through to um, small modifications that you can be making at home, like really, really simple things and how you create spaces even within uh, one set room. So I think there's kind of something for everyone in this one and it's it's quite an interesting um, 
an interesting episode. I think there's lots of self-reflection that you can actually do um, for your own home, whatever that looks like. So um, welcome to the episode. You can stay in touch with us on the on social media. I'm on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter, on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And subscribing and rating the show makes a huge difference. And, and like I basically say every week, um, just send this episode to one person that you think is relevant. Um, that's really how I want this thing to grow is basically it goes out to people who are interested in this topic because um, I think it's kind of niche, but um, people who want to hear about it really deserve to. So thank you and welcome to the episode. All right, cool. So researching happy, we are joined by Dr. Jenna Mikus or Mikus. Mikus, yes. Mikus, sorry. Um, right. So I, a little bit of background, I guess, what we want to do with the show is to bring in all the different fields, I think, that have some say over, over well-being and happiness. And, you know, sometimes the psychologists think that it's just psychology. And today we're leaning very much into that and talking to an architect, as I have understood. <laughs> uh, I think you're an architect. I really am not sure. You it's seem to have a, a lot of... Yeah, okay. You have a lot of hats. But um, let, why don't we go there? Are you an architect? <laughs> no, I'm not officially an architect. Okay. And I'm also not an engineer. I was trained as both, but... Yes, I'm not certified in either. <laughs> okay, okay. But you've studied it. Yes. So okay, undergraduate cool. was engineering and then my master's was architecture. And then my yeah. PhD is design for health. Fantastic. All right, cool. So I have found myself married into a family of architects. I've got two architect brother-in-laws and an architect father-in-law. And they also are Greek, proudly Greek Cypriot. So you're about to tell us about architecture from the perspective of <laughs> the most famous Greek of all time. So yes. I'm sure they'll be listening to this episode. Um, you, <laughs> like, tell us a little bit about yourself. You've got such an interesting um, aspect, like such a unique sort of pathway. Mm, it's quite different. Um, so I find it's helpful just to walk through almost chronologically what my journey yeah. has been, because I think that that sheds the best light on my perspective and sure. even how I come at my practice now. So, um, yes, my undergraduate was mechanical engineering. It was as close as I could get to architecture. I did mechanical engineering, business <clears throat> and art history with minors. And so that was kind of the artsy engineer in me coming out. And I was recruited before graduating to be a business consultant. So I did strategy consulting for some of the big firms, worked with government, which wasn't as exciting as it sounds. And I know it doesn't sound very exciting. <laughs> um, but that took me to the ATO in Canberra, the Australian tax office. Really? And I was more interested in the building I was working in than the work I was there to do at the time. And uh, it was just a lovely building, lots of natural daylight, they were composting. So for somebody who was interested in sustainability, that really sort of fed me and showed me what was possible. And this was around 2009 or so. Okay, whoa. And uh, I always loved doing consulting. I like problem solving, worth working with clients. And um, I said, I still wanna do that. I just wanna do that in an industry I care about. And that seems to be the built environment. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do a master's. I found a program in the UK that was excellent, that was with the Architectural Association, known as the AA. It's very well known in the architecture community. So I, again, became kind of this outsider going into a program. I was an engineer business person going into an architecture school, but it was a very pragmatic program. So it was about sustainable design. And I became very interested in the human element of design. And we had a visiting professor from Cambridge, and he talked about what's called adaptive comfort theory, allowing people to interact with their spaces just by opening windows and closing them rather than over technifying mm. the experience. And I just thought there was so much value in that and started to apply that to as my smart buildings consulting practice that I then did for the second decade of my career. And, you know, it really tried to emphasize that people and then sustainability. So, you know, kind of designing for all life in the work. But it got a little bit too um, technology as a panacea approach yeah, for me. For sure. I and I um, understand that. Yeah. And it was interesting because around that same time, there was something called the International Well Building Institute. And they mm -hmm. were setting up the well building standard that is now more well known than it was a few years ago. And my smarter clients were asking me in 2018 or so what it was, 
you know, let's point to some case studies. How can I do health and well-being design better? And I crazily thought maybe I could help contribute to some literature on the subject when I couldn't find many good examples and decided to begin a PhD and start my own consultancy at the same time. And um, around that same time, I came across the term of Aristotle's eudaimonia, and I had never heard it before, never studied philosophy. I'm married to a philosophy theology major guy who had, you know, switched from (laughs) civil engineering. So, you know, he would help me cheat and understand some of these terms. But once I came across eudaimonia, I thought it had a lot of potential as a design for your best self concept yeah, yeah and it could be applied in the built environment as one of these health and well-being focus areas but as a way to design for comprehensive health so physical mental and social yes. as well as kind of that positive psychology side of things so that people could feel motivated in their spaces and so that's that's what i do now is designing for spatial and kind of organizational environments to okay. enable eudaimonia, eudaimonia eudaimonic well-being Wow. And so it sounds like you're very ta- tailored like to individuals. I, I kind of give the example. It's probably not a very good example, but this idea that, you know, like in Australia, we kind of have this issue that people go to work and then they go home and then they kind of stay there. And then we have to try and teach people about the importance of, you know, social interaction. Whereas, say, in Europe, you've got piazzas all over the place where people, they're, they're a built environment that is conducive to social you know connection you don't have to teach anyone anything because it's just natural right. are you thinking is that in way of that's kind of more like a social good kind of version like the idea of a piazza is that in your thinking or are you more thinking about an individual within their home so i think of it from both perspectives and uh, that includes especially when you're thinking about individuals as well as groups but also buildings and individual homes of those buildings but then also communities so urban design as well so okay. i i definitely play in in both in both sides but the relatedness side gets to self-determination theory so if yes. you're thinking about interrelationships with people that is something that i consider too okay and it might be really useful at this point to have an example if you don't mind like if you think of like could you almost give us like a bad version and a good version let's say like an apartment building i think that's easy to gang up on you know Mm. an apartment building that is just like 50 kind of cubicles um narrow hallways no interaction like small elevators i don't know um (laughs) (laughs) yeah no idea but could you give us like a bad version and then what something more conducive to flourishing would look like yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, let's if we take a residential example, I think that's a good one. So you can think of it as being, you know, dark, dank, dreary, you know, maybe it has some mold. God knows this happens more often than it should. Um, maybe very little natural light, uh, especially openable windows. A lot of times you can't even open your own windows and get that natural passive ventilation going for good fresh air. Um, uh, sometimes you might have glare as the opposite of the dank, dreary environment. It might just be okay. reflections off of the buildings next door, and then it can be blinding, and that's overwhelming, and you get too many high le- light levels in your space. Um, you know, and there, there's the other aspect of noise. We have this constant, you know, percussive sound that happens with construction. I just relocated from Brisbane, where everybody is doing tons of construction for 2032 Olympics. And, you know, it'd be day and night. And so if you're living in a space where you can't have quiet to be able to focus on your day-to-day activities or that, especially that tranquility you require at night, especially to sleep, that can also be really, you know, deleterious on health. Mm. So, um, you know, those are some of the health sides of things that you can think about. The other things that I oftentimes get into is the inclusive aspect of design. So designing for intergenerational needs. So older adults is what I focused on with my PhD, Mm -hmm. but I also do a lot of neurodiverse focused design and Mm -hmm. sensory sensitive individuals. So understanding how to design respectfully with some of those groups in mind as well. And so with that, those are the ways that I try to address the physical, mental, social aspects of health. And social can also come with being able to sometimes socialize based upon your needs and wants of the day. Yeah. Um, people like sometimes just to have a vantage point and see people moving about below them. Um, and then being able to know that they have the autonomy to yeah. engage when they wish and how they wish. Yeah. Um, and then there's also just being able to you know, see the views and connect with nature. 
So, you know, being able to have connection with humans, but then connections with your outdoors, then that's very helpful. And of course you can do different things too, like bring the outdoors in by, you know, putting a plant um, and some of those other aspects of what's called biophilia to, you know, rely on that human to nature interaction that we have physiologically ingrained in us. But, um, you know, by doing all those different pieces, you can satisfy the needs of people's, for people's health needs for physical, mental, social, but then you get to those other deeper needs of well-being about you know having that connection to place and giving people choice and being able to leverage people's competencies and understand yeah. their place in society and meaning and so that's the sort of work that I try to enjoy in my practice yeah okay and how um, this maybe is a stupid question because I'm pretty sure I know the answer <laughs> but how common is this mentality in the sort of building industry or in the architecture social built environment industry oh no it's a good question so um in terms of health and well-being like i said around 2018 it started to get some good traction but when i came to australia in 2019 i was actually surprised how few people were aware of the international well building institute okay and they're the ones who oversee the well ap well standard all those things and um it's grown i mean amazingly the past few years Australia is actually heading up a lot of the the work and demand right now okay. so um, that's been lovely to see um, and then part of your question too I guess is talking about health and well-being I'm very unusual that I focus on well-being and on flourishing yep. and eudaimonia in particular so you know eudaimonic well-being eudaimonic design is a term that I've kind of created by applying eudaimonic well-being mentality and science yep. to the built environment. So that's unusual. Um, I think the people who are designing for health are designing for comprehensive when they're doing it well, but oftentimes people are just ticking the box and doing one thing, saying, you know, we're going to do some natural daylight. We're going to bring a plant in. Mm -hmm. And it's oftentimes just one siloed aspect and approach. So um, it's getting better. I think the awareness is there. COVID certainly helped yeah. with understanding what people's environments can do for them or do against them. Yep. Um, one of my favorite future articles came out right at the beginning of the COVID experiment, as we say. Um, ironically, it was by Joseph Allen, who's of Harvard. He heads up their Healthy Buildings program. And he had just written a book, Healthy Buildings, before COVID happened. But there was a piece and it was something about how your buildings can either, you know, keep you well or make you sick. And mm -hmm. I think it was actually inverted. It was, you know, your buildings make you sick or keep you well. Yeah. And I thought that that was such a perfect way of saying it so people understood what was happening. And that was even before the conversations about air quality were happening too, recognizing that impact on COVID. Um, a lot of us who were part of the advisory groups at the time were discussing these things, but it wasn't even officially accepted by CDC um, for Center for Disease Control yep. for a year or so after. Really? So, um, yeah, the, the idea of understanding the importance of quality environments, you know, is not just a nice to have. It's really sure. a necessity. Sure. And that's been more proven. OK. And does it go to the detail of materials as well? It does. Yeah, materiality is huge. Um, you can think about the quality of materials, and then yep. that's why when you think about low VOC paints, the volatile organic compounds, okay. those smells like your new car smell in a car or the paint smell that you have in a new apartment, that's VOCs that you're normally smelling. So if you're purchasing low VOC items that are doing less offsets or mm -hmm. less, um, less of those putting out the bad gases, you know, so to put those are bad for you. So if you're using quality materials layered on other quality materials, that's going to be healthier yeah. for you. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Oh man, it's like so contra um, con not controversial, so comprehensive is what I meant to say. So yeah, comprehensive. Yeah, and complicated too. And complicated, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I guess then the next question is like, is it expensive? Like, is it a, do you have to make the business case? Um, you know, when, when you have clients that probably think like, oh, I could just use concrete and um you know it's going to cost me a hundred dollars or i can use some sort of special material and it's going to cost me 500 is that a conversation right. that you often have to have it is and i've had that less lately and i think again it's because people are having that need and desire that's superseding even the math side of things um, a few years ago some of the math was done and it was talked about that it really was almost negligible for really? the 
the amount of money that would be extra and needed for some of these things. I mean, okay. you can go to town and spend a lot of money and throw money at a problem and make it fancy and unnecessary, but to do healthful design, that can be done for, I think it's normally, I wouldn't say three to 9% higher. So it's really not that bad. It's sure. really just understanding early on that that should be a focus and emphasis in a design process that's already rather complicated on its own. So people are hesitant to add any complexity to something like this. Yeah, but if the need is overshadowing anything else, then that's going to encourage them to do it more easily and more cool. readily. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. All right, cool. So it's, if we were to take a few steps back, so um, I'd love to hear you started this PhD and we'll, we'll sort of get into the sort of the outcomes of your PhD, which sound incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. When you were like, you know, what was the, what was the big impetus to say, actually, you know what, I need to, I need to now contribute to the literature now. I need to know the answer to this question. What was, what was the driver for that? If, is there such a, th yeah, is there one? Oh yes, no, I mean, there was. So when you go and, you know, start the PhD, you kind of, embed yourself in this academic life, whether you want to or not, right? I mean, it's almost unavoidable. So um, for me, I wanted to contribute to as much of the academic rigor as I could, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also build that foundation into my practice, but also be able to stay with one foot in industry so that I could have that back and forth bridge across academia and industry, yeah. so that the industry real life application could feed my research and vice versa. And I feel like that's still a struggle and something that I'm you know, trying to encourage on both sides. But um, for me, it was almost an innate sort of challenge that I gave myself because mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to contribute to both sides. I made a very intentional choice too, not to only go after you know, top level journals, which I knew would take a long time to come to fruition. I wanted to be able to put information and ideas out there sooner, mm -hmm. connect with a larger, body of groups too because my work is of course you know it's architectural it's engineering it's psychological it's a variety of things but even even from the architectural point of view you have buildings you have asset types of buildings and then you have urban landscape and then how you approach all those things too it's very different all the different layers so okay. you know i really was just getting all the tentacles out there so yeah i, I did as much as i could while trying to keep myself sane and on schedule. We'll put it that way. Great. And whilst also starting a design firm as well at the same time, right? Yeah. So I had started the firm before doing the PhD. Okay. So 2018, I had started it in the US. And so when I came out here, I was already kind of getting things underway. It was really just continuing practice within Australia. And so um, I was able to almost practice my own self-determination theory in having the autonomy to choose when I wanted to engage with certain clients sure. and for which projects. And I feel like I've gotten almost a bit spoiled that I was able to have that you know, level of choice. But it was a nice way to, again, keep in touch with industry and being able to put some of these ideas into practice. Okay. And so, and so I'm just, I've got a really dumb question, but it's like, you you said you've got a I think you said you've got a your husband is a philosophy slash theology. When you started going like, Oh, this idea of eudaimonia, was he just like, Yeah, I've been trying to tell you that for the last twenty years? Was it that kind of no. thing? No, no, no. He and he's not that deep in it. He had just studied it for his masters. He oh, okay, was an okay, undergrad okay. civil engineer. And we joke that he's a recovering engineer gone social work, so he okay. does very different work now. Um, but we have been having some overlap lately because cool. not only that background of his and you know, and then the flourishing, how that is related so much to theology and philosophy. But um, he does a lot of work with people with disabilities and helping to develop partnerships to find jobs for them. And so we can kind of dork out together about how to design environments for a variety of people and nice. their pref preferred needs. Um, and so that's been really nice to have that crossover as I've gotten into some of the design for all and inclusive design approaches. Yeah. Okay, nice. It's nice when it's kind of complimentary like that. So yeah. the PH what was the sort of the overarching question of your PhD? Oh man, whenever people ask me this, okay. it's, it's something I feel like I've kind of like suppressed. I know I should know that research question off of the top of my oh, head. Oh, like I don't care. You don't have to express it in research question language. Okay, but okay, I mean, just okay. In like it's general... not the proper jargon. So no, it's something like, how can people be empowered 
to realize eudaimonia in yep. their spaces, something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally boggling that, but it was around those lines. No, I mean, that makes total <laughs> sense, yeah. Well, and it sounds like from just sort of reading between some of your work, it sounds like you really focused on developing this model of design. So that would be amazing to sort of learn a little bit more about. Sure. Um, uh, so what I started out with was this idea of self-determination theory and mm -hmm. DC and Ryan and all these different people saying that that would be a means for designing for eudaimonia. And um, when I first began my PhD, I had no knowledge of that. I was really just thinking this, you know, how do you design for eudaimonia? I think that'd be really interesting. And then, you know, some ideas of how I might be able to explore that. Um, but it wasn't until I was a couple of months in and somebody suggested SDT to me that I started thinking about that seriously and then getting into the literature of it. So, um, yeah, I think it was all about exploring that as the foundation of the model, seeing if self-determination theories, autonomy, competence, and relatedness could indeed be designed for, especially when considering designing for eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. So that was the foundation of the model was, you know, designing for those aspects and then seeing if those could be a way of designing for health and getting that comprehensive health approach that I talked about too. Mm -hmm. So you would have the health as well as well-being, which is, you know, the, um, the inexplicable almost satisfaction of the health and then all the, the needs as well for just, you know, how you feel as a human. So I wanted to test that early on, but then I also wanted to develop some principles that would be design guidelines for designers but also emphasize how those could be used by occupants and everyday people who mm. just, you know, are living in their homes and they want to have an idea of what they could do to make them better. So um, it ended up being layered with um, nine different principles that were on top of that foundational model. And then I related that to old school architecture, Vitruvian ideas of design, which is really getting into form and, and function and durability and some of those different aspects. So I haven't fully published the model yet, but um, I'm kind of slowly doing bits by bits. So I've done kind of that first layer publication and then I'm working on something for the nine principles now that I've written, but it hasn't come out yet. So baby steps, it's basically three layers and, um, you know, and then uh, you can see the power of threes and then, you know, like a bottom layer of three, an upper layer of nine principles, and then a top layer of another three for the okay. Vitruvian triad. Like the golden ratio of design yeah. principles. Yeah. Very as close cool. as and, I can get. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> and so a few, just, just to sort of make sure we're all on the same page, especially myself. When you say design, is that really thinking about like designing something from the ground up or can this even be like improving a space? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. And I should have clarified that. No, so when great. I talk about design, it can be new builds or it can be retrofitting existing. And right. especially, you know, we don't want to be encouraging new builds because that's wasteful. So it's right. what you can do to adjust your space now. Yes. And that's the other reason why intrinsic motivation is very important is to encourage people to do something with the spaces they currently inhabit. Okay, cool. All right, great. And so, and you said, um, did you say Vitruvian design? I've never heard of that before. Yeah, As in like there's a Vitruvian um, man sort of thing? Is, it, is that where it comes from? Similar but different. Yeah, so Vitruvius is uh, very well known as being kind of like the first architect. Oh, okay. Normally. And uh, yeah, the, there are three kind of foundational principles that are normally referenced in Latin that are in, in alignment with that work. And so when you hear, you know, um, form and function, that leverages some of that mentality from okay. way back when. I was not trained in... I'm, I'm actually looking around for one of the books I have, but um, I do have a Vitruvius book somewhere around here. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. I, it's, you know, supporting the monitors and everything else around here to get my desk er ergonomic. <laughs> but um, yeah, you can, you can look some of that up and anybody who understands architecture has probably learned that much more in depth than I have. Yeah. But it was more when reflecting on the principles that came out of the study that um, my supervisors were reflecting with me and they were like, you know, that actually does mimic a lot of what is foundational for Vitruvian theory. And then sure enough, we were able to marry up some of those things nice. too. Cool, mm -hmm. it's nice when it works out like that. And then last question just for background is, did you have a particular definition or a particular model of eudaimonia that you were working towards? Yes, yeah, so um, 
And what I would normally do was that eudaimonic well-being side of things, trying to make that more of the um, approach that I would going at, go after. And then again, the DC and Ryan description of some of that work. I would oftentimes think of it, and this might be a very simplistic way of thinking of it for your listeners, but when, um, when it's de defined as being your best self, mm. I thought that that was the most relatable way of describing eudaimonia. And I really liked that because, you know, when you're going through all these different other elements of the philosophy and, you know, getting into morality, I thought that that could get a little too philosophical and a little bit too, you know, theology based again, like, are we doing the right thing? Are we going to be judged if we're not? And, you know, we can get into a spiral of rumination, knowing that, you know, nobody's ever necessarily doing as much as they should be. Sure. So um, I thought that being your best self and understanding with that comes what Aristotle normally would talk about as being, you know, there, there are good and bads that come with it, and that's just being human. I thought that that took that into account really naturally mm -hmm. and would allow for an organic understanding of what the term meant, not only for people, you know, reading my work, practicing my work, but also my participants. And as my participants were older adults living at home alone during COVID, I wanted it to be as understandable a concept as possible to them. So it wouldn't be anything that would be, you know, exclusionary, um, but would make sense. Okay, yeah. great. And I just did actually think of one other question was, in what discipline was your PhD? Officially, I began in design, but there was an organizational change while I was at school, okay. so officially ended up in engineering. As much as I tried to buck the trend and not go back to engineering, I have an engineering <laughs> degree. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Another great. one. Yes. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, cool. And you did that in Brisbane? Yes, at QUT. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. So, yeah, so that's a lot of background, I think. So let's hear about what, what was it that you were up to in your PhD? Yeah, so PhD, um, it focused on residential homes, and that was interesting of its own right because I normally work with a variety of buildings and less commonly residential, unless it's you know on a very big multi-residential scale. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought that that would be an interesting thing to interrogate. And of course, with PhDs, you know, we're constantly encouraged to narrow the focus, narrow the focus, because it's five PhDs in one, but you gotta narrow the focus. So I focused on home, um, and that was pre-COVID. So at the time it was just, you know, I think that'll be convenient, excuse me, to understand people's, you know, home environments. Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be interesting to work with older adults. And this is one of those things that was driven by a little bit of my husband um, and his influence on my work. Because when we first went to Brisbane, I took him to an event that was hosted by QUT, and it was a design for all week. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, I think, architected primarily by what ended up becoming my, uh, who ended up being my supervisor, my principal supervisor, Janice Rieger. And um, it was this excellent set of events. And I was just so smitten by the idea of good design is good for business. And I was surprised how little I had heard about inclusive design practices in, you know, strategy work that I had been doing right. you know, for 20 years. And so, you know, my husband's there to network, but I'm really just dorking out on the side being like, there's so much potential here. You know, if you design with and for these, you know, communities that are considered to be on the edge, especially mm -hmm. older adults that have lived experience, then that's kind of its own strategy to design for all demographics. And so I was like, why aren't more people trying to explore this? I think that that's great. So I ended up designing with and for older adults and um, focus on the home because of just the need to age in place mm -hmm. around that same time the um oh no the Glo global center for modern aging i think is the name out of adelaide are you familiar with gcma yeah, yeah. Very, very okay much. good i want to blank for a second on the acronym but um they had some great reports coming out at that same time that were talking about there's like 90% of people want to age in place, but they don't have the infrastructure, financial support, knowledge to be able to make that a reality. Age in place meaning age and stay in their home. In their home, Rather yes. than an aged care home or something like that, yeah. Precisely, yeah. Cool. So they wanted to be able to do that. And yeah, you know, once you get to a certain age, it's like 90% of people wanted to make that a reality. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so I thought that that was convenient because I was right, on the, right around the time of my confirmation. So I was able to point to that as being its own need. You know, it's very, very high need. People need to understand this. And we need to understand it not only from the architecture point of view, but or the architecture designer point of view, mm -hmm. but from the occupants so that mm -hmm. they and their families can do things. So yeah, it, did, it was all about exploring how you can design for eudaimonia at home, having this ideal environment that would support your ideal self and um, you know, exploring what that looked like. And I used all creative methods to do it in a very qualitative way, which was also very different because most of my work was always you know, scientific programs in the past, but I thought that this would be fun. And because of COVID, it was 100% remote. So I did online workshops. I sent out what's called creative probes, design probes, where I would do a package of items and send it to the participants. And they would use a camera I provided to them that was like an old Polaroid where it spit out a picture and then they could sort it based upon how they would categorize that area of their home, whether wow. it's a place they loved or disliked or cool. felt their best self in. Yeah. Um, and then I did drawing exercises and then some journaling and just got to the heart of, you know, how they would describe how would they, how they would depict those oh. areas. So you did that all remotely? All remotely, yes. So when they were doing like drawing exercises, were you zooming in or was it just that they were given instructions? Right, so it was the latter for that. For um, So I did three different phases. The first phase was doing online interviews just to first get to know them. And then I would send out the creative probes. They had a week to complete the activities in their own homes, send them back to me. I went through the data and then we had follow-up interviews so I could clarify cool. what they had provided. And those were all one-on-one -on -one calls. Yeah. Um, and then stage, phase two was all about getting everybody together. So that's when we started mm -hmm. having group workshops online using Miro when that was still kind of new. Okay. And um, I didn't have everybody drive because that can be overwhelming if everybody's using their mouse and doing things with sure. Miro, if you're familiar with that online sort blackboard. Yep. Yeah, so they have like the online, it's almost like an online whiteboarding collaborative system. Mm -hmm. And I did it so that I use Zoom as a portal through which people could see the Miro board and yep. I just set it up with visuals so that we could sort ideas and talk about design in groups. Cool. Yeah. Have you, are you, um in any way connected with Taxi, um, the center, the Australian Center for Social Innovation? No. Have you heard of them? Oh, okay. Is it T-A-C-S-I? Yes. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've seen it, but no, I have no connection. Oh, I think they would, they, this is like their bread and butter. I think they would love to oh. know about this stuff basically. Um, so anyway, so um, that sounds really interesting. So what an, what an, a unique way of collecting information. Um, mm. And with, uh, one other thing, I guess, when we're talking older adults, what would you, what did you define as an older adult? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So I identified that as ages 65 to 80, living independently. So, you yeah. know, these are, these are very able-bodied people yep. um, and wishing to age in place. So they were uh -huh. already interested in the subject matter, which, of course, you know, is its own kind of, you know, predilection towards wanting to contribute sure. to this work. But... Yeah, the, it was that, and um, it was really interesting, especially the living alone element of that. They were old in. people that were living alone, or they were... Yes, they okay, were they okay. living alone. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, what kind, of, what kind of stuff came out from that work? Yeah, so um, a variety of things. So at the end of phase two with the workshops, it was interesting because we were first identifying these ideas of almost sustainable action and desire. And it reminded me of some of the things that Frank Martella has gotten into with, um, what is it, beneficence in addition okay. to SDT and having it you know, be almost this altruistic desire to contribute to society and to your fellow man and mm -hmm. you know, being able to not only create a space that's good for you, but you know, for your community. And so I, I saw some of that come out of that, that second stage, which I thought was really interesting. And I did a very small piece for The Lancet that was about that. And this um, idea of eudaimonic design could potentially be the symbiotic methodology to design for people. And then if they're feeling their best selves, they can perhaps design for planet. And then that would, of course, benefit them as humans mm -hmm. to be you know, in a healthier environment. So that was one thing that came out. Another thing that came out was, um, of course, the nine principles and 
the principals, I, I should have put those up in front of me, but they kind of run the gamut and they were each on a continua. So it would be like privacy and security and these different things um, based upon people's wants and needs. And of course, how those would change, again, referencing the idea of continua and uh, Aristotle and all those mm -hmm. different things too, that there's never a perfect sure. way of putting things together, but at least it's a guideline. So the nine principles came out of it. Um, another Are you thing able that to came... share those nine principles with us? I can, but I don't have them in front of me. Oh, so that's okay. I you can... can... I'll, I'll multitask and maybe try to bring them up as Is we chat. Is that okay? Yeah. You, you, but... we, can, we can wait or you can point me the link. Or... I can point you to the link as well. Yes, because yeah. my... It's online, so we can do that oh, at one cool, point. Cool. But um, yeah, the the actual PhD is is published, so that's oh, out okay, there. Cool. Yeah, what, it, send me the link later. If you could just pull yeah. them up, we can uh, patiently wait because I think that'll be so valuable to hear what they actually are. Sorry, oh, to, sure. <laughs> sorry to put you. No, on the that's spot. okay. I wasn't sure if you wanted to edit it or something like that, but yes, let me try to bring them up. I just have to go through the three hundred some pages of the PhD to oh, okay. find it. But um, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. But I was going to say, as I bring that up, one of the other things that came out of the study unintentionally was that people were motivated to do different things, not okay. only in their spaces, but in their lives. And so that was something that I really hadn't intended for or asked for. It was, you know, people just on their own talking about how they were motivated to tackle projects in the past that had been really overwhelming. And I haven't quite done the comparisons of whether or not that awareness was derived from some of the exercises in particular. Like maybe it would be good for me to go back and look at the photographs okay. and see if some of the areas that they hated were things that they eventually addressed. I okay. probably should keep that in mind. I feel like that would be a really good thing to do. But <laughs> I had something about disliked versus hated at one point too. In terms of parts of their houses? parts of their houses yes right. and uh, what the difference was that the things that they hated at times were things that they could do something about and okay. they hadn't done something so they were almost you know blaming themselves so they were embarrassed okay. whereas disliked it was one of those things where they could it was outside of their control so it was something that gotcha. they it bothered them and niggled at them but it wasn't enough that it was just really getting to them so even understanding that discrepancy was kind of interesting. So yeah, what they ended up doing was taking on some of that and being motivated to change things. Interesting. And so one person tackled, you know, I always reference this example, but tax documents that okay. were overwhelming. One of his rooms, he had, you know, like eight years of tax documents okay. and he finally <laughs> cleaned those up. Um, and then other people just wanted to, you know, get a little bit nicer, backgrounds in their houses they they got jealous of my dracaena plant behind me on some of our calls and they referenced that and said they started talking to their kids about it and that enabled them to have that relationship and discussion about the bi biophilia yes. and the kids bought them plants and they started right. putting those in the corners that this was actually photograph related but when they took pictures they realized that they had a really empty sad corner and they thought it would okay. benefit from a plant. So yeah. it was cute that it took shape in terms of, you know, not only doing things and just making spaces nicer and more inhabitable, but it also helped people to get up and try different things. Like one person who was, I, in addition to the older adults, I did have some designers who joined the, the workshops, mm -hmm. but um, they were brought on not to be experts. They were actually brought on to design for their older adult selves. So that was also okay. kind of its own experiment of sorts. But um, a couple of people actually took on additional extracurricular learning because they became really you know, interested in the health and well-being focus. So somebody signed up for a master's program and yeah, they, they referenced not only the fact that the, wor the work was interesting, but they were motivated to do more and learn more. Cool. And I was like, oh, this is all <laughs> unexpected and lovely. And it speaks to, you know, motivation yeah. and intrinsic motivation. And that tax document is an interesting example because I was thinking like, I, I think I've still just got architecture in my head. I'm just thinking like windows and views and things like that. But you're talking about the, like the junk maybe that you have in your house or, or the yeah. clutter, I should probably shouldn't say instead of junk, but the clutter yeah. or the furniture now I'm thinking, or yeah. Okay. I, that was a perfect example. Cause I think I had a, a much straighter uh, idea of what we were talking about, but now it's like extremely inclusive. Yes. Um, 
Whoa. And okay, I did bring so, up the the nine principles too. Oh, so whenever let, let's you go want there. To chat let's about go there. Because okay, and okay. I just want to put on hold. I'd love to know what were the most common places that were like hated, disliked, and loved. I'll, I'd love. I'm going to ask you that later. But let's go into the nine principles. Okay. Now. It's been a long. You know, a few months out of this work, and your brain just forgets. I know, and so. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm asking you these. No, <laughs> to it's remember. okay. Uh, I probably I should review these things more often than I do, but. Um, yeah, you know, once you write things, you kind of don't want to look at it Absolutely. for a while. Absolutely, yeah, especially so I'm when still in deadlines and stuff, it's like, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> but um, okay, so for the nine principles, I won't share my screen, I'll just maybe talk you through them, sure, if that's sure. okay. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, it's not a lot of physicality. It's not necessarily like architectural structure for these. These are more overarching themes and goals. So um, one is, and I'll, I'll maybe even prioritize them. So there were four that were considered high priority. Okay. And so um, that was safety, security was one continuum, affordability, accessibility, flexibility, adaptability, and privacy connection. And you can mm. see that continuum, especially with privacy connection, it was, you know, being able to connect on your terms as you wish. So those are the high priority ones. Then two mid priority, maintainability, reliability, comfort, familiarity, and then low priority were cleanliness, organization, logic, intuition, and ecology, sustainability. Wow. And so I have definitions of those two that accompany, but um, hopefully that gives you a taste. Yeah, I think they all make sense, but the, probably the logic and intuition, that's the one that probably raised a question mark for me of what, what did that mean? Like it had a logical, what, what does that mean? <laughs> You're not you're not alone in that because I feel like that's something that you know is is constantly discussed. But I think that that was driven especially by the fact that we were interrogating the subject matter not only from a physical design perspective mm -hmm. but also a digital perspective, understanding that smart buildings would have a gotcha. place to play gotcha. and a role to play in this future. Okay. And so we were talking about effective smart building design because again we try to describe it in terms that wouldn't be off-putting or overwhelming mm -hmm. a lot of effective tech design especially for older adults involves some level of familiarity and logic gotcha. so yeah, if well, it references a point then. to the past exactly like having a button that looks like an actual button yeah those yeah. sorts of things <laughs> reference points yeah sure yeah okay mm -hmm. cool yeah i think a friend a friend just um has done a renovation we went to their place and i couldn't like i couldn't switch the light on because it, it yeah. had this like it had like 50 controls in one single light button that you could it was a dimmer but also on off i couldn't do it so i, I totally get that yes um okay well that's that's really interesting that makes a lot of sense okay this is all i'm think i'm catching up now okay so <laughs> that's you. good yeah i know it can be confusing there's a lot going no, on <laughs> oh, I, I i just think i came with a one idea in my head and it's just starting to realize that that was just a very very narrow aspect so in terms of the, I love that idea of the hated versus the dislike kind of almost has this self blame element to it. That is really interesting. Was yes. there the equivalent sort of positive version, like a pride of the bits that they had improved versus like, oh, you know what? I really wish that I reviewed my analysis chapter. Oh, that's okay. I'm sorry. You don't have to. No, you but yes, I there, there was, and I can't remember what the distinction was. Um, I know as soon as I read it, I'm going to be like, a, oh yes, of course, that was it. Um, Don't stress. I'll try to think about that, and then maybe I'll get back to you. But yeah, no, loved, that's fine. there was a distinction between the like versus loved, and then uh -huh. there was also a distinction between the loved versus the eudaimonic being your best self environments. Okay. And what kinds and, of, can you sort of oh, paint see, again, what they... Oh, see, again, you're not supposed to ask me these questions because I don't remember that. <laughs> but um, there was a distinction. Should I just leave it at that and then you sure. know, plant the seed? And then maybe okay. I'll, I'll do a, um, a cheeky search as we chat and see if I can... <laughs> no worries. I'm sorry that I'm remind myself. totally on the spot for this. <laughs> That's all right. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay, this is this is... I guess I'm wondering like what, what was almost like what was the outcome? So these older people have been through this design sort of process. You've sent them these interesting sort of interactive um, activities. I'm not sure what you would call them. Mm -hmm. Part of that, it almost sounded like an intervention in a way because they almost recognize bits of their life or bits of their environment that they 
would like to change or will change. Is that, was that the sort of the intended outcome or was there a different outcome? Obviously there was the generation of the principles along the way. Yeah. So, I mean, yes and no, you know, with, with PhDs and projects in general, I always have these broad ambitions of, sure. you know, things we want to do, but I intentionally set it up too so that the different phases aligned to how I normally do projects. And okay. this is like old school consulting where you understand where you are and where you come from before you understand the next step. So I always call it as is analysis versus to be analysis okay, or nice. you know present state versus future. That's just kind of the consulting terminology. So you can see that background putting on my change management hat comes into play for that. So phase one was about understanding the past and the present, how the past informs the present mm -hmm. and depicting elements of past, present, a little bit of future in mm -hmm. that first phase and almost preparing people to talk about the future before going there. So I did it for a few different reasons. It was so that they could understand what they like, what they respond to today, mm -hmm. what they think they respond to today, mm -hmm. and really get into the details of that. But then also reflect back to when they were younger and see what spaces they liked back then. And I actually did that, and this was a suggestion of my principal supervisor as well, she had said as maybe a, an icebreaker that we could have something that wouldn't just be, hi, my name is, I like to do whatever. Yeah. Um, it could be, hi, my name is, this was my favorite space I've ever been in my life. On um, It could be on a trip, it could be you know like a home or whatever else. And, and it's really interesting to have people think about that sort of thing. So in Queensland, I mean, even though I had participants from all across Australia, I had a couple of participants who talked about growing up in a Queenslander home, which is a very specific typology of home. You know, that would be normally kind of up on stilts, allow for passive ventilation, have outside, you know, you could sit on a porch. Yeah. And Google um, it for non Australians, just Google it. Yes, yeah. please. They're very interesting. Um, but that was kind of a lovely memory to evoke for people. And so they not only were able to start understanding the specific architectural elements of a space that they responded well to, yeah. but feelings that came with it. And, you know, a little bit about the response to it now. Like what is a nostalgic kind of response? And what is something that's valuable that they could take from that now to apply in the future? And um, I thought that that really helped with a lot of them. And some were particularly good about breaking it down by even the spaces and aspects of health. So I remember one woman talked about how she had, I think it was a Queenslander as well, that she was renting or sharing as a share home. And she was talking about how she had identified almost zones. And she was doing like nighttime work, so she was sleeping during the day. And so, of course, with the extreme sun of Brisbane and Queensland in general, you need to be able to escape that sun if you're sleeping during the day. And so she would sleep in the basement where it was cool and dark. And so that was kind of her tranquil area. And then, you know, she'd have a pool so she could get physical exercise when she wanted to. And, you know, she would have her different areas where she could read and, you know, do photography or whatever those different spaces. And so you could see that physical, mental, social satisfied in her areas of home as she was just explaining to me why she liked it. And it wasn't even just like, tell me physically why you liked it. Tell me mentally why you yeah. liked it. It was how she was thinking about it. And um, mm. it was interesting. So that was phase one. Phase two was all about, you know, futuring, which is kind of its own design practice term, mm -hmm. having design futuring um, and exploring and building upon some of those concepts and that foundational work they had done in the first phase. And then thinking very creatively about the future without making it too out there because i know some of them push back a tiny bit when asked to do a magic wand exercise like okay. imagine you have a magic wand and you could create your space to be ideal you know a couple of people are like my grandchildren like magic wands i don't need a magic <laughs> wand okay. you know and then just overcoming some of those um stigma ideas then sometimes they were the best at well, not the best i'm not going to judge people on how good they were with doing activities but they were the most um that's a word. Engaged, uh, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, uh, ex you know, excited too when it came down to it, and uh, it was really interesting just to see that transformation take yeah. place and their engagement with the work. And I, uh, a, a lot of it just sounds so interesting. I've got a lot of questions, but I'm almost thinking like this maybe 
maybe I'm just a moron. I have no idea. But, you know, I think maybe most people or maybe it's just me. We think of our house as like, that's my kitchen. That's my lounge room. That's my bedroom. But I, I don't imagine that people think about it in terms of spaces. Right. Yeah. And there's like, do, do you think the average person does? And, and if not, like you're probably missing out a bit because like maybe there's right. your reading chair within your lounge room or something. Yeah. And I think that that's really interesting because as I've gotten more into academia and then teaching for design and engineering and all that, there is very specific theory with placemaking and the fact that placemaking has this element of connection and association. And so that's very different than a space. And it's funny because I still think that terminology is a little bit muddied and I can't decide if I'm for that distinction or not but space for versus me a room or space versus it? place oh, and okay. place having more value than space because i okay. almost think of space as being like i don't know that's almost more it's, it's easier to connect that and a little bit more understandable to me but either way i think place and space rather than room either yeah. of those terms is more valuable yeah um you know a lot of people use zones too within okay. kind of the built environment okay. world which you know is especially kind of like an air conditioner kind of thing yeah it is. Yeah, exactly. So you have your HVAC <laughs> zone. So, if, you know, like, do you have your individual control within a bedroom versus a living room? Yeah. But um, I do like to some degree, as bad as COVID was, it also helped blur the lines on some of the conversations about how you use your spaces. Okay. And understanding that, you know, you can have dedicated space, even if it's in the same room, you know, by having a curtain and saying, right. you know, this is this is mommy's workspace. We're going to leave that alone or, you know, yeah. just those certain areas to be able to break that out. And I did um, just like a small casual interview piece for Wellbeing Magazine a couple, I think last January of 2022. Mm -hmm. And it was all about relationality and social connection within the home. And it talked about that sort of thing is, you know, having dedicated spaces and like even within my office, I have like a little exercise area and then like a little reading area. And then an area that my dog thinks is, you know, his other area, okay. one of many homes for himself. So, you know, just having those dedicated spaces and then you put yourself into those positions and start thinking differently. And I, I think that there's a lot of value in that. Okay. And is there like, uh, okay, cool. So that's, that's really useful. I, I'm almost thinking like, did I answer your question? Might... I don't even know if I did. Uh, no, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. No, okay. that was really okay. helpful. Um, Good. And I'm just thinking, just one comment, like I imagine the idea of like space versus like rooms or place versus rooms becomes more and more relevant as the spaces that we're talking about get smaller. Like if we're talking about tiny homes or just like small homes or apartments, yes. the way that you sort of economically divide up a room, you know, becomes right. more and more important. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I could just imagine that there's a lot of people, um, I know that your work is not only focused on older adults, but I'm... I would imagine that there would be people thinking like, oh, you know, my my parents or my grandparents, they could benefit from this. Like, what could I do yes. to go and improve their, you know, their their ability to flourish in their environment? Like, is there something you could give us in terms of recommendations there? Yeah, so I think a few different things. It would be, you know, potentially being able to leverage the principles that came out of the work yep. and, yep. you know, understanding that a lot of them are really just driven by respectful design. Okay. So understanding that, you know, even that idea like you were talking about, um, the familiarity and pulling together some of those points of reference and logic, knowing that there's not one answer and one good approach to this. It's, you know, trying to think back and consider reference points that you know, whoever you're trying to create a space for, what is something that's gonna resonate with them? What will they understand? And then how can you approach that discussion so that it's not coming from a, a condescending perspective? Sure, sure. You know, it's, it's a, let's just kind of patiently walk through this and figure it out together. And I like that one of the principles that came out of it was about maintainability and reliability. Yeah. Because we got into some discussions about even you, um, if you're talking about appliances in the home and how they're now designed to fail faster and you know how oftentimes in the past they were able to fix something for you know decades yeah. but sometimes they didn't know where to begin or they didn't have a trustworthy mechanic who could come out and do different things for them so it's you know providing some of the tools also to you know parents if it were 
Um, you know, and understanding too that, you know, financial well-being is a big component and that's why affordability is one yeah. of the higher prioritized yeah. items. So yeah. making sure they're feeling good about that and understanding, of course, you know, safety, privacy are core. Those were two of the four. And then the other one was about flexibility. And this is where I think the self-determination theory was especially interesting because how much were we talking about flexibility and choice in workplace wellness during COVID for the past few years? Mm. That's been such a focus. Like Harvard Business Review continues to talk about people are jumping ship and going to other companies because they want to be able to have that flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's mimicked and or at least held true in this work. And I feel like almost everybody would benefit as a consequence. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of ways that people could do it. And then I think on top of the nine principles, if people want to help their you know, older adult family members, friends, whomever, that, um, you know, having that empowerment is really key mm -hmm. and not in a way that it's controlling or, you know, pushing somebody to act. It's trying to enable them to have that kind of revelatory moment and encouragement on their own. And yeah. that I got into quite a bit of crafting. I kind of got more into that referencing work crafting and life crafting as home crafting. Like this became kind of its own element of home crafting, being able to curate mm -hmm. your spaces on your own terms. Mm -hmm. So allowing people to have that space and encouraging them to have that space yeah. to do that. So don't um, just go and buy like 50... Um, indoor house plants and say here you go mum right. <laughs> this right. will improve your well-being and then she's probably thinking now i have to water this stuff and i hate the way that that one looks and blah 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 i know yes no that's a great example because i think um you know you can do different things like that and people's hearts could be in the right place but the value of some of the interactions that happened as a consequence of the work when even they got you know plants from their kids it was the conversation that led to the identification, the sharing between right. them saying, you know, I'm doing this exercise and here's what's been really interesting. And, oh, I identified that I need a plant. And then the kids listening, hearing that and acting and gotcha. then being able to maybe get a plant that the parent really wanted and then putting that sure. in place together. Sure. And yeah, so it was cool. that whole thing that became interesting and important. Yeah. Interesting. All right, cool. And so... um. Oh, I had a question, but now it slipped out of my mind. What was it? I don't remember. That's okay. So, so where to from here? So the PhD is done. Congratulations. Done. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. <laughs> that was pretty quick. You, did you, when did you start? 2019. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. And, and so now you're sort of like, are you full time? Um, at, the, at, you know, you're like the managing director of the firm. You, is it called Uday Group? Yes, so it's called Uta Group. I'm managing director or managing partner, depending upon where in the world we are. Okay. Um, so still doing some advisory work with that and doing publications to try to tie some of those things up with a nice bow just as much as I can, you know, and I'm yep. still doing a lot of advisory work, like with the Well Building Standard. I'm one of their 23 research advisors globally. So um, Great. we haven't been meeting that much now, but when it picks up in a month, then that will become a bit time consuming. And then I've connected with, um, like now that I'm in Melbourne, University of Melbourne, I'm involved with a couple of people who work in architectural science and like Lindsay Odes Wellbeing Center. Cool. So just trying to stay connected with academia and then find where my next full-time role will be, whether that will be academia, where perhaps I could do some industry engagement or full-time industry and then try to, you know, do some applied research. Yeah. That okay. So you, you still want to, you have a commitment then to keep doing the research? Yeah. I mean, not formally, but I, I do personally wish oh, yeah, to. That's what I, mean. yeah. I like that. Yes, 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 yes. Exactly. And, and what's the motivation, can I ask? Because it's, you know... Researching is not necessarily the most fun thing in the world to do. And yeah, it sounds like true. someone who could go full time in industry, you might think, I'm kind of achieving what I wanted to achieve anyway. So, just out of curiosity. I think yeah. it's curiosity. I think it's curiosity. And that's, um, you know, we, we joke that I go to school every 10 years. So, I've already warned okay. my husband I'll probably be a medical doctor in 10 years <laughs> yeah. if I'm going on this trajectory. But um, I think it's just understanding, and, and that could be what's always driven me my whole life is, you know, wanting to learn more, want to understand better. And um, I think that's also just being a good consultant. You know, if you're trying to understand your clients, what motivates them, you know, part of that comes down to 
very big picture questions like what motivates humanity and what kind of big questions can we answer and take on together as wicked problems. You know, when you're talking about sustainability, it's just such a, you know, this greenwashing approach to life and yeah. a lot of the sustainable design work. And if you're approaching it from, you know, a more legitimate perspective and going after, like I was just on a call earlier where we were talking about biomimicry and applying that to built environment design and how you can learn so much from nature and have that be a more symbiotic approach. Okay. Those are the sorts of things that drive me because I know that we can always do better. There are a lot of different ways to tackle problems. It's gonna require inside out, outside in perspectives to make sure it works. I mean, that's what drove me to the work I'm doing now is understanding it's not just gonna come down to architects or certification bodies, you know, otherwise people get complacent. Yeah. It's understanding the occupants are the ones who are occupying the buildings and using the energy and only then can we understand how to even begin to tackle problems okay. before doing it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so I mean, is it sometimes I think the research that we do in our team, it's almost to sort of drag the rest. We, we, we feel like it's to kind of drag the rest of the world along in a way to say like, you know, yeah. here's some research. You can't kind of deny it. So, you know, that kind of justifies some of the things we'd like to see in the world changing. Is, is there an element of that for your work? Almost like research for advocacy? Yes. No, it is for sure. I think, um, a couple of different points to that would be not only raising the awareness about why it's important to design for health and well-being, which again has kind of become more understood the past few years, which mm -hmm. is nice. I can almost chuck out that part of my PowerPoint okay. or discussions now. So one is raising awareness of that. One of, is also about how to do design correctly or at least meaningfully so that you know you have this element of praxis and engagement and respect. And then also making sure you're designing for groups that maybe have not experienced the most equitable circumstances. Yeah. So having this health equity and understanding that you can design better for a variety of people, especially by doing intentional co-design and not just you know what a lot of people use, thinking that that's the thing that they need to say, though they're not doing. Yeah. Um, you know, and then hopefully have designs that are gonna be more legitimate at the end and not just something that's gonna look pretty it's going to be inhabitable and enjoyable and yeah. hopefully encourage people to flourish so they contribute back in kind to Absolutely. others. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And with the well, um, it was it the well building standard or yes. the, yeah, the well building, how, how, um, how I'm wondering how consistent is that? Is that an international standard? It is. Yeah. So it's, it's international. I think the first version came out around 2016, 17. Okay. I'm always bad with this year, but, sure. um, and then they did a version two a few years later, right around 2019, 2020. And what was interesting right around the time that I was learning about design for all, when they transitioned from version one to version two, version two, which much was much more inclusive. So rather than have fitness and exercise as one of the core philosophies, they had movement. And so yeah. it allowed for yeah. people to have that element of movement. And I think that that's been really interesting to see evolve. There was not only that, but during COVID they had, you know, different things about identifying um, a healthy building. And they had certain labels that they, you know, suggested putting on buildings that people could say there's healthier air in here. So it was supposed to help the general mm. public feel more comfortable going into spaces when, you know, it was a time of turmoil and uncertainty. Sure, sure. So that's been good. And then um, I contributed to a health equity group that has been working the past few years. And they just had a specific certification that came out last, last September, I think, that was for a health equity focus to their work. And so they continue to evolve. And that's been really nice to see. Great. And so I, I guess I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Excuse me. You. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm almost thinking of like a friend who say like on the, on the smart city sort of thing, like put all this smart stuff into his house and mm -hmm. then started hearing about like EMF issues, electromagnet, like, I, I, you know, started hearing about some of this stuff and then was like going down the rabbit hole of like, look how different the standards are of like, what's an acceptable level you know, like Australia was a pretty high, I, I have no idea, but you know, pretty high. And then like Germany was very small and he was way over their recommendation. Um, like most of the areas in his house, like, is that an issue that this well, um, like, is that, does it, does any of that sort of work feature in, in yours? 
So it's not, at least not to my knowledge, it, that's not explored in for Well AP yet. I think International Well Building Standard, that could be something we explore. That's part of the research advisory group. Like some of it is more technology focused. Yep. So that might be something that we look at in the future. Um, but you're right. I mean, it is very geographically circumstantial for the different thresholds. Yeah. And, I'll be curious to see where that goes. I'm actually a little surprised it's taken as long as it has just to be able to be recognized, let alone explored properly. Really? Really? Yeah, because I mean, there were, if you think back a few years ago, I feel like there were a lot of documentaries that were talking about people's experiences. And even in, I've learned over the past few years doing the work that I do is that I'm sensory sensitive. So I can hear noises that my husband can't, like high-pitched noises that our fridge makes and really? you know, things that he has no, oh yeah, he's completely oblivious to sounds outside <laughs> and they make me crazy. And I can see there's there's something called misophonia and that's when sounds can actually make you get to the point of anger and it, okay. it's just something that's uncontrollable. And I'm not quite to that point, but you know, you can start seeing how different people react to different circumstances. And if people are experiencing, you know, some of those different levels of, you know, wavelength, sounds, et cetera, I think there there might be some truth to it and it'll be worth exploring. And, mm. you know, it doesn't necessarily help us to technify our environments. You know, we're a natural species. We do better in natural environments, which is why arguments for biophilia are so compelling. So, you know, putting too much technology in a space can oftentimes be detrimental. And there are ways that I think that it can enhance our well-being. Of course, yeah. But it's just a matter of, yeah, exploring what those are. And I would have loved to do more technology exploration in the PhD, but that was another thing that we had to kind yeah, of, that's you know, a, rein another in. PhD, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> cool, maybe in the next 10 years of study. Okay, and so maybe. is there like a particular aspect of the built environment that you just think, like if we just say the Australian, the Australian um, example, is there, a, mm. is there one aspect where you go like, oh, they've got it completely wrong? Like, oh, that's such a great question. Hold on. I'm going to process that's for a okay. moment. Let's see. <laughs> I have my suggestion, but I'm really keen to hear yours. So. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, I think people could argue for affordability could be one point right now because it's becoming very expensive in the cities. Okay. Um, but in terms of inclusivity, I know that that's been a very interesting thing to look at. A lot of the buildings and even just around the urban landscape, there are lots of stairs. And mm. that's one thing in the U.S. that I think has been pretty decent has been the creation of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and compelling people to, you know, be more cognizant of ramps and yep. just yep. access. And as much as I try to avoid the term accessibility, because a lot of times that's seen to be less respectful. Sure. Um, there is an element to it having inclusive design pros for that. So I think that that could be dealt with better for sure mm -hmm. but i don't know i'm curious to see what's your suggestion uh well it's from a lived experience i have to admit but um okay. open plan workspaces oh where yes. it's i just think i just i just go like this is so unnatural i mean to be honest like offices in general i have to say yeah. they just seem not to work and probably thinking about a couple of these these principles that you've got here Mm -hmm. I think it kind of got like, you know, for example, privacy, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it just doesn't work. And I, I wonder, yeah, I just wondered whether there was something that came to your mind of like, we, we, you know, probably the other one that I had in my mind was like apartment buildings where, you know, those really, not all apartment buildings, obviously, but those ones where it's really like cookie cutter, right. 150 rooms in a, in a building sort of thing. It is a lot. And I think, you know, depend I was thinking about residential typology when you asked the oh, question. Oh, okay. Sorry. And yeah. No, and that's, that's good because, you know, I, I just have to kind of get into the proper space. Excuse me. Um, but I was going to say also a lot of the difference between older and newer buildings, there are these stark contrasts of either it's too dark in the older yeah. buildings and the new buildings are floor to ceiling windows, which is what I have. And the glare is ridiculous. And right. you know, there's... When you rent, you only have certain types of window control. So, you know, you might have blinds, you might have shades. So I only have shades 
you know, they go down. It doesn't account for reflection or privacy people could see in. Right. Um, and you know, there's constantly glare, especially Brisbane. So Brisbane was so problematic for that sun. And then the solar gain that comes in because, you know, we could talk about how it's overheating your space and then you're conditioning to offset that heat that comes in. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, some of those things, that's a pet peeve of mine. But workplace wellness, yeah, if you think about open plan, I know Libby Sander does some excellent work out of Bond okay. looking at why it's bad to have open plans for noise. And um, yeah, those, those need to go. I actually did a, a podcast last week that's called the Work Life Podcast. Oh, cool. And um, we talked a little bit about the spaces and workplace in particular. Yeah. But yeah, yeah spot on. You're right. Okay, interesting. <laughs> and it's funny with the go back to the the architect family now but you know they they have at their place something that i've just never ever would have thought about and i don't know whether i'm the average or that's the average but you know like three types of blinds say you know like one which is kind of just for glare but it lets a lot of light in one that is kind of like fully you know um, one is more that's privacy and then another that's like fully blackout blinds Yes. That seems to be like a, a, a flourishment, a flourishing sort of conducive design feature that you, you might want in your apartment right now. Precisely. Yeah. And you have that element of choice, but then you're, this is a, that's a great example of well-being science and architectural science, because you're giving people the option to use it as they wish, when they wish. But yeah. then you're also saying, given the orientation of the building, given the outside, you know, just conditions and the materiality used, you know, maybe you could even impose an overhang to help with something like that for glare oh, okay. and make sure that it doesn't penetrate as deep into the space of the room. But yeah, there are a lot of different ways around it, but that's a good example of how you can kind of tick both boxes. Yeah, cool. All right, cool. I, th I hope that that's really, yes, for people mm. that are listening, I'm hoping that's making um, a lot of sense. And it, I think it's obvious. And I, I, the other, oh, that's the question I was going to ask you before, sorry, was with the older people, when you were talking about going through this process, but it doesn't have to be from that example, it can be any of your design work, how much, how much is your work giving the solutions or is it, helping them arrive at the solutions because it sounded like almost the yeah. older people were sort of figuring out for themselves but it was the value was was you sort of getting them to that conclusion yeah so for the phd it was very much them arriving at at, at arriving at it with them by themselves i don't know however i'm trying to say that right now it was a co-design experiment so we were working okay. together collaboratively i was trying not to impose Yep. specific ideas yep. what I would normally do for you know like my advisory work it was more them exploring what they wished mm -hmm. but you know remember also in phase two I did have the designers in there right and okay. these were people who were in architecture and engineering and when they were designing for their older adult selves they of course had that knowledge to be able to apply yep. but when it came down to prioritizing voice I did prioritize the older adult voice a little sure. bit more because sure. sure. um, we did have a couple of ties even for the high priority items you know like safety was of course more important to the older adults whereas you know elements of privacy were almost a little bit almost misunderstood I should say by okay. the designers and so just understanding those but you know my advisory work the consulting I do is much more advisory and then doing a little bit of guidance to see what people really want from a personal preference and experience sure. point of view okay. Okay. so it depends what I'm doing yeah, great. Okay, cool. And so is there anything else that we haven't covered in terms of your work that you think could just be, um, you'd really like to share just for a final sort of wrap up? Sorry, I know oh that goodness. you've got such a broad <laughs> body um, of work. I'm trying to think if anything comes to mind from what we had chatted about quickly beforehand, but, um, oh, you did mention in some of the pre-prep that um, you were curious to see the difference between the eudaimonic design approach that I created and then the Harvard Healthy Buildings yeah, please. Yeah, standards because right. they have their list of, you know, what is it, the top nine or whatever that they actually, I just realized that that's nine as well. That's kind of funny. But um, I did a paper on this a year or two ago, and it was all about workplace wellness mm -hmm. and how eudaimonic design would be compared to not only that as an architectural wellness perspective, but also when you're thinking about organizational wellness. So when I get into workplace wellness, it takes on kind of spatial and organizational support. So people talk about what they want to accomplish in the future, and then I help guide them on how best to get there. And that involves not only the physical space, but then also organizationally what they need to do 
to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And so with eudaimonic design, by designing for SDT, I was able to show that it satisfies all different elements of both the organizational wellness and then Harvard's architectural wellness areas. And so that was really just the way that I corresponded those. So they're similar and my approach does allow for that, but because it has the well-being factor, it allows mm -hmm. for more and has different yeah. aspects of feeling in there. Very cool. Yeah. I can imagine that um, they'd be wanting to catch up to that missed opportunity, basically, right? Like it doesn't make sense. It's just different. And I mean, I have tons of respect for Joseph Allen and, you know, the school and as they do so much of that work, because they've been really in the vanguard of doing so much of this. But um, yeah, I think doing a little bit more well-being focus would go a long way. So I'll be curious to see how that goes from here. Amazing. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. I, I, I'm not, I hope you've enjoyed this. I feel like it's been yeah. a, I've really take, you know, I don't know if this has been like my worst interview or what, but uh, you know, I don't know. We've just kind of <laughs> taken you to all sorts of random places and jumped around a little bit, but um, this has been really, really interesting. And I can imagine that people have got inspirational ideas or inspiration and ideas of what they could be doing around their place already, just from having heard this uh, hour conversation. So Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, of course. And uh, yeah, thank you for your work too. I listened to a few of your podcasts in preparation. And uh, now I know a couple of other people to connect with, like Mark oh, Fabian. Amazing. He has some similar, that eudaimonia as an approach to hedonia to be able to realize the experience of well-being. And yeah, so I really appreciate your work. Thanks for having me no, on. No, no problem.